This is a brief introduction tutorial on visual decoding. Visual decoding is often referred to as visual recognition or visual inference. Part 2. Algorithms and Examples Let's recall our previous story of trying to decode motion direction for neural responses. When our example neural response was 14 spikes per second, we guessed that the motion direction is downwards, since 14 spikes per second is closer to 12 than to 20 spikes per second. A better reasoning of this guess is as follows. If the motion direction was actually downward, then according to this neuron's response properties, this is the probability to generate a response level of 14 spikes per second. If the motion direction was upward instead, then the probability to generate the same response is lower. Therefore, the decoded motion direction is downward. This decoding algorithm is called maximum likelihood decoding. It is to choose the decoded solution S that maximizes the likelihood that the observed neural response is R. At this response level R, let's say it is 16 spikes per second. It is equally likely that this response is caused by a downward or an upward motion direction. Therefore, if the neural response is larger than this level, the maximum likelihood decoding is to have the outcome as outward motion direction. This is therefore the optimal decision boundary for maximum likelihood decoding. The decoded solution will be upward or downward, depending on whether the observed neural response is larger or smaller than this decision boundary level. If a priori, we know that the chance for motion to move upward is only 20%, then when the response R is at this decision boundary of 16 spikes per second, we will prefer to say that the downward motion is a better decoded solution. We will shift the decision boundary a bit to the right so that only when response R is really much larger will we start to prefer the upward motion direction. Therefore, this prior knowledge makes us bias the decoded decision and shift the decision boundary. Therefore, visual decoding is often viewed in the framework of Bayesian inference. A visual scene S has its prior probability PS. For example, the scene feature value may be upward motion with 20% probability, and the value may be downward motion with 80% probability. The scene evokes visual response R through a likelihood function P R given S. This likelihood function is the conditional probability of response R given S, like in our example. Bayesian inference is to estimate the scene value S given the response R through the conditional probability of S given R. If the decoded value S maximizes this conditional probability, this decoding scheme is called maximum a posteriori decoding. By the Bayesian formula, this posterior probability is proportional to the likelihood and proportional to the prior probability. Therefore, if we use maximum likelihood decoding 
to choose the seen value s to maximize the likelihood. It also helps to maximize the posterior probability. If the prior probability p s is the same for all seen values s, then the posterior probability depends only on the likelihood, so that. The maximum a posteriori decoding is the same as the maximum likelihood decoding. For example, this can be a posterior distribution. It is over two possible s values, upward or downward motion direction, and since the probability is higher for upward motion, the decoding outcome. Which is denoted by s hat is the upward motion direction, and this is the motion direction perceived. In another example, the posterior distribution is over a continuous variable. For example, s can be the orientation of an object, taking all possible orientation values within the range. The perceived orientation is this value at the peak of the distribution. The difference between the perceived and the actual visual property is the decoding error, or perceptual error. When this error is large enough, it gives visual illusions. The spread of the posterior distribution characterizes the perceptual uncertainty. In the discrete case. When the probabilities for both s values are substantial, the perceptual uncertainty is also substantial. It can lead to ambiguous perception or perceptual rivalry. Let's characterize the decoding performance with our example of decoding motion direction. With this decision boundary. If the motion direction is up and gives neural response r equals to r one, then the decoding outcome is correct. If the response is r two, then the decoding outcome is incorrect. Therefore, the size of this area under the red curve is the probability of correct decoding outcome, and this area is the probability of incorrect decoding outcome. If the actual motion direction is upward, similarly, if the actual motion direction is downward, the size of this large area under the blue curve is the probability of correct decoding outcome, and the size of this tiny area is the probability of incorrect decoding. Therefore, if upward and downward motions are equally likely, the probability of correct decoding outcome is the average of these two areas, and the probability of incorrect decoding outcome is the average of these two areas. If we are doing a task to detect upward motion and reject the downward motion. Then this area is the probability of hit, meaning detecting correctly, and this area is the probability of miss, not detecting upward motion. Similarly, this area is the probability to correctly reject a downward motion, while this tiny area is the probability of false alarm. To falsely declare a downward motion as upward motion. If we move the decision boundary, then the hit rate and false alarm rate increase or decrease together. So, if we plot these two rates against each other, these are the two corresponding pairs of hit rates and false alarm rates for the two decision boundaries. With all possible decision boundaries, we get this whole curve, which is called the receiver operating characteristic curve.
or ROC curve. The area under this curve is never less than 0.5 or 50% and no more than 100%. The decoding performances are better when this area is bigger. When the two distributions of responses are less overlapping, the decoding performance is better. The separation between the two distributions can be described by a measure called D prime, when the two distributions are Gaussian. This formulation can be used for discriminating two general visual inputs, A and B. In our example, they were motion direction up and motion direction down. Our MT neurons response R is an example of a decision variable used to make decoding decisions. So here we have two Gaussian distributions for the decision variable, capital R. The two distributions, one for input A and the other for input B, have their respective averages, r bar a and r bar b, and standard deviations, sigma a and sigma b. The prime measures the separation between the two distributions. It follows this formula. Roughly, it is the difference between the averages scaled by the standard deviations. When we have an unbiased decision boundary, then each d prime value in such a case determines the probability of a correct decoding outcome by this formula. Let's look at an example of discriminating between two visual inputs, A and B, using the responses from photoreceptors on the retina. For example, the input A could be the image of an apple, and the input B could be the image of an orange. Then using the photoreceptor responses, you can decode whether the retina sees the apple or the orange. Let's say that we have a group of photoreceptors, call them receptor 1, receptor 2, receptor I, etc. And their responses are R1, R2, etc. They depend on whether the input is A or B. For each receptor, the receptor response fluctuates from trial to trial. So if we average across trials, there's an average response. We denote this average by putting a bar above each RI. So this vector describes the average responses of these receptors to input A. And similarly, this vector is the average responses to input B. For each receptor I, the response RI is stochastic. For each trial, this RI value follows a Poisson probability distribution. This distribution has an average R bar I that depends on input A. For example, this is the probability distribution of RI when the average is 4 or 8. For a population response of the whole collection of receptors, its probability is the multiplication of individual probabilities for each receptor's response, Ri. This is thus the likelihood of this population response given a visual input, alpha, which may be input A or input B. To decide whether the input is A or B, the maximum likelihood decision is to see whether the likelihood under input A is larger than that under input B. Equivalently, this is to see whether this ratio between the likelihoods is larger than 1, or whether the log of this ratio, called the log likelihood ratio, is larger than 0. Putting these mass expressions together, this log likelihood ratio is this whole expression. 
In this expression, these two items are constant values that do not depend on the actual responses in the trial, but depend on what input A and B are. That means they depend on the nature of this discrimination task. These RI values are the responses, actual responses for this particular trial. And this log likelihood ratio therefore contains a decision variable, capital R. This capital R is a linear function of the population response R, and this function depends on what inputs A and B are for discrimination. One could build a linear network to calculate this decision variable, capital R. It is a weighted sum of individual receptor responses. The weights are the individual log likelihood ratios from individual responses. This capital R is a stochastic variable since it is made of a sum of stochastic variables. According to the law of large numbers, this capital R is approximately Gaussian when there are enough receptors. The mean and variance of this Gaussian distribution depends on whether input is A or B. So here the mean is R bar A or R bar B, and the variance is sigma squared A and or sigma squared B. We can then compare the decision variable R with a threshold value, this is the decision boundary, to decide whether the input is A or B. Note that each receptor's response Ri is a Poisson random variable. Poisson random variables have the property that its variance equals to its mean. Therefore, capital R, a weighted sum of Poisson variables, has its mean equal to the weighted sum of the means, and has its variance equal to another weighted sum of the means. Each of these second set of weights is the square of the corresponding weight in the first set. In visual psychophysics, Discrimination task is often studied by the method of two-interval forced choice task. Input A and B are shown in two separate intervals. In the first interval, A is shown and then B is shown in the second interval. Or they are shown in the opposite temporal order. An observer then reports whether A is shown in the first or second interval. In our formulation, let these two vectors be the population responses in the two intervals. We then get the two decision variables, capital R1 and capital R2, for these two intervals. The maximum likelihood decision is to say that A is in the first interval if R1 is larger than R2. The probability that this decision is correct is the probability that Ra is larger than Rb. From our plot here, we see that Ra minus Rb is a Gaussian variable with its mean and variance as follows. Then, from the d prime value, we can calculate the probability that our decision is correct. We can measure the minimum difference necessary between input A and input B to make discrimination good enough. This minimum difference is called the just noticeable difference, or discrimination threshold. For example, when a d prime value is equal to 1, then about 76% of such decisions are correct. And the corresponding visual input difference between A and B is often defined as the discrimination threshold. For example, when A and B are two slightly different orientations of certain visual object, then the threshold is the orientation discrimination threshold. Sensitivity to a small difference in visual input 
is then defined as the inverse of the discrimination threshold. The smaller the threshold, the more sensitive is the visual system to a change in input. For example, input A is a blank image, input B contains a grating with a small luminous contrast. When this contrast is very small, A and B appear very similar. We can ask human observers to discriminate between these two inputs in the two interval force choice task. The data points in this plot are their contrast sensitivities. The sensitivity is better when the grating has a lower spatial frequency and when the average luminance is higher. If we predict the sensitivities from the maximum likelihood decision performance using the photoreceptor responses, then the sensitivities are higher by a factor of about 20. These black curves show these predicted sensitivities after scaling down the predictions by this factor. Therefore, other than this scale factor of about 20, human observers roughly follow the maximum likelihood decision strategy in this task. This method of theoretically predicting the optimal performance is called ideal observer analysis. Here is another example to decode the orientation of a bar. Now the visual feature to be decoded is theta, the orientation. Let's say that it evokes a population response from a collection of orientation-tuned neurons. Let each neuron have a Gaussian-shaped orientation tuning curve. For the ith neuron, the preferred orientation is theta i. In this plot, each dashed black curve is the tuning curve for one neuron. These are the peaks of the tuning curves. Each peaks at the preferred orientation of the corresponding neuron. So the preferred orientations for the whole neural population span the whole range of orientation. If the input orientation theta is zero, then the blue dots on the blue curve are the average responses from these neurons. Of course, in each trial, the neural responses are stochastic. So, for example, the red crosses may be the actual population responses for a particular trial to this theta equal to zero input. This is the likelihood the probability of the population response vector r to each input theta. Each neuron's response ri follows a Poisson distribution with its own average response r bar i given by its orientation tuning curve. Taking a log, this is the log likelihood. For each population response r, Maximum likelihood decoding means that the decoded orientation theta hat is the theta that maximizes this log likelihood, or it makes this derivative zero. You can pause the video to see this calculation of the derivative. If the preferred orientations, theta 1, theta 2, etc., are densely and evenly distributed, such as the situation in our plot here, then this summation is roughly zero. Then this is the decoded orientation. It is the weighted sum of the preferred orientations, and the weights are the responses of the corresponding neurons. Given an input theta, the decoded value theta hat differs from trial to trial due to the stochasticity of the responses. The standard deviation of this theta hat characterizes the decoding uncertainty, so it's the discrimination threshold. In many situations, this threshold 
is related to the fissure information defined by this formula. The fissure information is the negative of the second derivative of the log likelihood averaged across trials. If the fluctuations of responses from different neurons are independent of each other, then the fissure information by the whole neural population is the summation of fissure information by each neuron. Then the more neurons there are, the more accurate is the maximum likelihood decoding. More generally, sensory input S evokes population neural responses, the vector R. The input S can be those in our example, such as input A, input B, motion direction, orientation, luminance contrast, etc. From the neural response properties, we have this log likelihood. From this, we decode the value S as S hat, which maximizes this log likelihood. The decoding error is, of course, the difference between S hat and S. This is then the Fisher information. The big bracket around the second derivative means the average over the probability distribution. Specifically, this is the average of this second derivative across all possible responses. Often, it turns out that the variance of the decoding error, sigma square s, is the inverse of the Fisher information. The discrimination threshold of the value s is roughly this sigma s. If the fluctuations of the neural responses r1, r2, r3, etc. are independent of each other, given the input s, then the Fisher information is the summation of individual Fisher information associated with individual neurons. For example, if some neurons are responses to one type of sensory input and other neurons for another type, then combining responses from multiple sensors increases the decoding accuracy in this way. Here is an example when we have to consider input features in two dimensions for decoding. The visual inputs are monochromatic lights. Each input light can be described by two input feature dimensions. One is lambda, the wavelength of the light, and the other is I, the input intensity. So if we have two monochromatic light fields like this, if they appear different from each other, it's not clear whether this is because they differ in input wavelengths lambda or in input intensity, I. So for example, in this example, is the test field having a longer wavelength so that it is more red in color than the reference field? Or is it merely having a weaker input intensity? Therefore, to discriminate input wavelength lambda, we cannot ignore input intensity, I. In one experiment, Wavelength discrimination threshold is clearly defined and measured in this way. The reference field has a fixed wavelength lambda and a fixed input intensity I. The test field has a slightly different input wavelength, lambda plus d lambda. If d lambda is sufficiently small, then the observer can adjust the input intensity I of the test field so that the two fields can appear identical. The experimenter can slowly increase the lambda, the wavelength difference, until the two fields always appear different no matter how an observer adjusts the intensity. The smallest d lambda when this happens is the discrimination threshold. This threshold d lambda depends on the reference wavelength lambda. This dependence is not trivial or not monotonic. We can ask whether these thresholds can be predicted from our decoding formulation. 
In our formulation, each light field evokes a population response vector R. This vector is three-dimensional for the responses from three types of cones. These cones are tuned to red, green, or blue color. They are denoted as L, M, and S cones since they prefer long, median, and short wavelengths, respectively. The average response of each cone is R bar A. Of course, it scales with the input intensity I and with the wavelength tuning curve F A lambda. This figure shows the wavelength tuning curves of the three cones. So two inputs of different wavelengths evoke two different population vectors in a three-dimensional vector space. These two inputs should appear different from each other if these two vectors differ from each other by more than that caused by the random fluctuations of the responses. Of course, the retina has many cones of each type. We can combine the responses from the same type of cones together and treat them as if it's a single giant cone. This giant cone has the same wavelength tuning function, except that it is scaled up by the cone density. And additionally, we take into account the attenuation of the light before it reaches the cones. All these are experimentally known quantities. And it is also known that cones follow Poisson distributions in their stochastic responses. So we can build this likelihood function for each cone. With response fluctuations independent between the cones, we have this likelihood function for the three-dimensional response vector R. And we have this log likelihood. With this log likelihood, the decoded input wavelength and intensity is then those make the first derivatives of the log likelihood function equal to zero. Now there are two such equations since there are two features to decode. One is wavelength lambda, the other is input intensity i. The decoding error is then this two-dimensional vector. Its variance is now a two-dimensional covariance matrix. And the Fisher information is now a two-dimensional matrix. You can pause the video to work it out. Now we can try to obtain the probability distribution of the decoded values. It is approximated as a Gaussian distribution in a two-dimensional feature space. The shape of this Gaussian is determined by the covariance matrix or the Fisher information. This means the long and short axis of this ellipse for the probability distribution is determined this way. This Gaussian distribution is centered at the actual input value, the actual lambda and actual i. So this center is the most likely set of decoded values. Each of the three ellipses here in this plot indicates a contour of equal probability for the decoded values. The larger the ellipse, the less likely are the decoded values. So let's say that on the largest ellipse, marked as the ellipse of uncertainty, the probability of these decoded values drops to a critical value, so that if the actual input feature lambda and i were shifted to those on the largest ellipse, the input field would appear different. This should therefore be the discrimination threshold for wavelengths in our experiment. We can then work it out to show that this is the resulting threshold. In this mathematical expression, everything is experimentally known except for a single parameter delta threshold. This parameter is determined by how big our uncertainty ellipse should be.
we can combine it with the intensity i to make it a single scale parameter. By adjusting the scale parameter, we fit this curve for the experimental data. Although the threshold depends on the wavelength in a non-trivial manner, the fit by a single free parameter is remarkably good. When neural responses are stochastic, following a Poisson-like distribution, then the variation of the neural responses scales with the average response R bar. This means the signal to noise of the neural responses grows with the average response R bar, or it grows with the strength of the input. This also means that the sensory discrimination threshold should decrease with the input strength. This is the situation in our color discrimination example. In general, discrimination threshold should decrease with increasing input strength in the maximum likelihood formulation. Also, we see that the fish information increases with the number of neurons responding to the input. So, in our formulation, the discrimination threshold should decrease with the number of neurons. So, our optimal decoding formulation tells us that discrimination performance should increase with the sensory input strength i and with the number of responding neurons. However, behavioral data seem to suggest that this is often not the case. For example, the color wavelength discrimination threshold is not really sensitive to how strong the input light is, as long as it is strong enough. A monkey's behavioral performance to discriminate the motion direction of the moving dots in our previous example is comparable to that by a single empty neuron tuned to motion direction even though there are so many such neurons in MT. We know that the input strength I, or the number of responding neurons, scales with the size of the visual input field or the duration of the visual input. However, in many behavioral tasks, sensory discrimination threshold is not sensitive to such numbers as long as the sizes and the durations are sufficient. Such low efficiency in utilizing the sensory input information reflects that our visual perception is limited by the selection stage in this three-stage framework of vision. Visual input is first encoded in particular by the retina. This encoding stage has its own inefficiency. However, the more serious inefficiency is in the attentional selection stage in the central brain. So far, we have focused on the maximum likelihood decoding process. It is a special case of Bayesian inference when the prior is a constant without any bias to any value of S. In such a case, we focus on maximizing this likelihood. Now let's look at the effect of the prior PS. This is often studied in behavioral studies where R is just visual input images rather than neural responses. This avoids the difficulty uh, that in general we do not know what the neural responses are. Then the same properties S are decoded using the Bayesian formulation and we can then compare them with human perception. Let's look at the example of motion perception through an aperture. In such a case, we need to infer motion velocity, a two-dimensional vector which has components Vx and Vy. They are the motion components along horizontal and vertical directions. 
and we infer the velocity from the input image i, which is a spatial temporal function. So every image pixel value depends on the pixel location x, y, and depends on time t. So let there be a long bar through a circular window, the aperture, indicated by this gray disk. The bar is longer than the aperture, so its two ends are not visible. But we just see a segment of it through this aperture. At time t, the input image for the visible part of this bar is like this. And at the next time instant, t plus 1, it is like this. So, the motion of the bar made the input image change. One image at time t and another image at time t plus 1. Many possible motion of the bar can make input image change in such a way. For example, each of these four motion vectors could do so. Which one of these velocities should be perceived? There is a prior probability of what are the possible velocities for visual objects. A typical prior is the low velocity prior. It gives a larger probability for smaller velocities. This prior reflects the belief that objects in the world typically do not move, or move just slowly. Then there is the likelihood. It is the likely values of images i as a function of x, y, and t, given the velocity vx and vy. From this, we calculate the posterior. Given the images i as a function of x, y, and t, what is the motion velocity vx and vy? Here, the likelihood factor is the same for all these possible velocities. The input i as a function of x, y, and t is the most probable for each of these velocities. However, the prior favors the slowest possible velocity. Putting the prior and likelihood together, the posterior is maximum for the smallest velocity among all possible velocities allowed by such input images. This decoded velocity is the shortest velocity vector in red color. Therefore, the perceived motion direction is towards lower right, even though the actual input is towards the right. This gives a motion illusion and is indeed observed in human perception. Therefore, the prior can bias the perception towards the one that is more favored by the prior. Here is another example. If you ask observers to report whether there is a vertical bar at this first location on the left, or this second location in the middle, or this third one on the right, and if they only had a very brief view for each location, they are more likely to say yes for the first one and say no for the second and third cases. In fact, these three locations are identical in terms of the image pixel values. So why do observers perceive differently between these locations? If you occlude this first location and ask observers whether they think it's likely a vertical bar is behind the occluding block, they will say that it's very likely. This is because this location is in the context of an array of neighboring vertical bars lined up above and below this position. This context makes observers believe that a vertical bar should be behind the occluder as part of the whole array of vertical bars. In other words, the context provides a prior belief that there should be a vertical bar there. Similarly, there is the same prior belief for the second location. 
However, for the third position, the prior belief would not be high for a vertical bar at this position, even though it might be for a horizontal bar. Therefore, the prior is high for yes in the first and second locations, but not for the third one. To get the likelihood, the occluders need to be removed to reveal the actual visual inputs at these locations. At the first location, the image pixels are the same as if there's no bar there. However, because the contextual bars appear quite faint, observers believe that the input is quite noisy, or the signal to noise here is poor. So in this noisy context, it is plausible that no image pixels are affected or activated by an underlying bar. In other words, the likelihood, the probability of no image pixels from the bar while the bar is present is quite substantial. At the middle position, the clearly visible contextual bars make it appear that the image is not noisy and therefore it is not so plausible that an underlying bar would affect or activate no image pixels. So the likelihood is near zero. At the third location, the likelihood will also be near zero. Combining the prior and the likelihood, the posterior is therefore yes for the first location and no for the second and third ones. When visual inference needs to infer many feature values for S, it can be very complex. Since S is a multi-dimensional vector, and searching for a maximum in high dimensions is often too challenging. It is not clear how the brain does such inferences. Some experimental observations suggest that there are fast feedforward mechanisms for visual decoding, transforming visual inputs in the retina to visual scene properties in higher brain areas. For example, for such an input image, if you ask, is there an animal in this image? Information about the answer is available in brain waves 150 milliseconds after the image appears. And a monkey can give the answer in 250 milliseconds. Human observers can understand photographs shown in quick succession at 100 milliseconds per image. A linear classifier can categorize an image using responses from 300 IT neural recording sites at 125 milliseconds after the image appears. These observations should be considered in a context that Visual response latencies are 40 milliseconds in V1, 70 milliseconds in V4, and 100 milliseconds in IT. These latencies leave only a small margin for feedback from higher to lower visual areas to give such fast decoding outcomes shown above. Artificial neural networks inspired by the brain structure have shown that it's feasible to recognize objects and scenes to a great extent from visual input images. Meanwhile, many observations indicate that the brain combines feedforward and feedback mechanisms for recognition. For example, most neural connections between different hierarchical stages along the visual pathway are reciprocal. In monkey's brain, the majority of neural connections are recurrently within a single visual cortical area. Visual perceptual behavior in difficult situations, such as in ambiguous percepts, suggests that the brain uses recurrent and iterative algorithms.
Many of the brain's mechanisms for visual recognition are to be discovered and understood by combining neural, behavioral, theoretical, and computational approaches.